Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of Karl Marx's 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon reading group series. Today is Sunday the 21st of June 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we continue our analysis of Chapter 2, The Downfall of the Republicans. Today I have the new patrons Alex Fleming, William Dalton and Ian Szabo to thank. If you like today's episode and want to hear more of this type of thing, perhaps you could consider becoming a Patreon. For only $5 a month, you get two Patreon-only episodes every month, the regular episodes a few days early, and the right to vote on the next Reading Group series. Your support really does make this show possible. Okay, let's jump back into this discussion. Let's move it on. So... The next bit where they talk about the election. I'm sorry. I did have one thing I wanted to say. I'm terribly sorry. Other than b- not being overthrown by a head, but f- fell down at the touch of a hat being like a fire line. Can we talk a little bit about mustache and uniform? Oh, yes. Why did we, yeah. how did we not say anything? <sighs> because oh. I just use mustache as shorthand for Stalinist autocracy and, you know, czarist autocracy and, you know, these different monarchical forms that pop up here and there. But to see Marx use it. But I think that the, the mustache was actually very, very associated with military men at the time as well. Right. Oh, absolutely. At, at the time, Tom? But not now. It's not now. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. In Canada, there is like a very specific mustache that only soldiers would wear. It looks very dorky. But it is it is just it is it is something that only you see soldiers, especially officers, wearing. I must say, my my uncle. I have an uncle who lives in Australia. He was well, he joined the Australian Army to get like a visa, a green card, or whatever in Australia. And he had now that I just think about it, he did have like a goddamn old fashioned like mustache thing for a while when he was in the army. That's freaky. So I, I, I just reread that sentence in, in, in Swedish and it has a, a word I was not familiar with. It's knevel bor. And I was like, I have no, because it, it means like knivel drill. And I was like, what the fuck is a knivel? Uh, so I just thought it was some kind of military instrument, but I Googled it and apparently it's a very specific mustache. It's the mustache, you know, where you have the twirls like that. It's the you mean mustache. the Stalin mustache? You mean specifically the Stalin mustache? No, the the, the Stalin mustache was like a you know a a, a slug. It's it's thick. And, <laughs> no, this is the waxed one where you have these twirls oh. that go out and, huh. and like. Doing, doing, doing. Yeah, that's um, that's the type my uncle had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, In the Swedish oh. translation, that is the specific mustache. <laughs> wow. See, okay, because I'm getting carnival mustache when I uh, <laughs> <All right. laughs> when I when I Google it. So we're going to get on here to talk about the election. We're going to get into the dissolution of the Constituent National Assembly, which was like a rehearsal for Bonaparte of trying to get rid of the National Assembly. So this was like part one of which was actually undertaken by by the Party of Order against the. Constituent Assembly. Okay, so who wants to read this bit? Okay, I'll I'll read it. I'll read it. It's no problem. It is sufficient to remark here that it was a reaction of the peasants who had to pay the costs of the February Revolution against the remaining classes of the nation, a reaction of the country against the town. It met with great approval in the army, for which the Republicans of the National had provided neither glory nor additional pay. Among the big bourgeoisie, which hailed Bonaparte as a bridge to monarchy, among the proletarians and the petty bourgeois, who hailed him as a scourge for Cavagnac. I shall have an opportunity later of going more closely into the relationship of the peasants to the French Revolution. The period from December 20, 1848 until the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly in May 1849 comprises the history of the downfall of the bourgeois republicans. After having founded a republic for the bourgeoisie, driven the revolutionary proletariat out of the field, and reduced the democratic petty bourgeoisie to silence for the time being, 
they are themselves thrust aside by the mass of the bourgeoisie, which justly impounds the, this republic as its property. This bourgeois mass was, however, royalist. One section of it, the large landowners, had ruled during the Restoration and was accordingly legitimist. The other, the aristocrats of finance and big industrialists, had ruled during the July monarchy and was consequently Orleanist. The high dignitaries of the army, the university, the church, the bar, the academy, and the press were to be found on either side, though in various proportions. Here, in the bourgeois republic, which bore neither the name Bourbon nor the name Orléans, but the name capital, they had found the form of the state in which they could rule conjointly. The June insurrection had already united them in the party of order. Now it was necessary in the first place to remove the coterie of bourgeois republicans who still occupied the seats of the National Assembly. Just as brutal as these pure republicans had been in their misuse of physical force against the people, just as cowardly, mealy-mouthed, broken-spirited, and incapable of fighting were they now in their retreat, when it was a question of maintaining their republicanism and their le legislative rights against the executive power and the royalists. I need not relate here the ignominious history of their dissolution. They did not succumb. They passed out of existence. Their history has come to an end forever, and both inside and outside the assembly, they figure in the following period only as memories, memories that seem to regain life whenever the mere name Republic is once more the issue, and as often as the Republican con or the revolutionary conflict threatens to sink down to the lowest level. I may remark in passing that the journal which gave its name to this party, the National, was converted to socialism in the following period. Like, I know it's oh, maybe, maybe not like the most, you know, serious commentary response to just be like, air horns, oh shit, he's a sassy <laughs> bitch. But I mean, air horns, oh shit, he's a sassy bitch. Like, what's really amazing, though, is that, you know, Marx is speaking as, you know, basically a sort of ex-Republican. And there, there are people that deny that he has this face, but when he's young, you know, when he's part of the young Hegelians and to be a Republican in, in the context of, you know, Germany at that time was a, a very radical position. And, you know, uh, so it's not so much of shame. It's just something that Marx grows out of. When he was editor of the, editor of the Rheinische Zeitung, that he was uh, uh, making liberal points. And he was getting disillusioned with the liberal points. But he was, of course, you know, in that process of moving through it. Yeah, you, you can't really understand Marx without thinking of him as a post-Republican thinker. Like some somebody for whom they believe in an old Republican spirit, but like it can't be achieved the way Republicans want to stamp virtue onto a social body, you know, even though it's supposed to be a, you know, a representative sort of stamp of virtue. There needs to be something vastly different, especially in its, you know, abstracted liberal bourgeois form that isn't really taking the social revolution into account. This is a farce. This is at best an echo of history. And at worst, it'll, it, you know, it delivers you what the, the old Republic was delivered to. This is amazing Republic in which you can have the, uh, the uh, legitimists and the Orleanists rule conjointly. Just yeah. set aside those it's, family feuds. So the legitimists are those that support the Bourbon royal family, the original one before the original re revolution. And they are essentially landed gentry. And then the Orleanist are the branch that are basically backed by largely finance and the big industrialists. So it's kind of like replaying the British, the corn laws thing of the landed gentry fighting the, the upper and coming bourgeoisie. When I read this and then when I read, listen to the uh, Mike Duncan podcast on, on this revolution, I couldn't help but think about the point that McNair made in our other reading series about when you have like a, a revolution, you don't invite like the former power that you conquered to govern with you. And yet what did this, what did this Republic do precisely? They did precisely that, which it just is baffling. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. I mean, to an extent they had to, because they had this universal suffrage and that's how the votes sort of went. Right. 
is that implied by universal suffrage? Does universal suffrage mean you can allow the former governing bot powers to run? Because, like, I don't know if that necessarily applies, but maybe I'm misunderstanding something. No, I think it's more the kind of Republican principles that they were basing their government on, which also caused them to allow the socialists into the election, too, right? The kind of universalism that they, they brought in, yeah, it kind of implied that. So, yeah, I think you're right. These are separate issues. What it also makes me call into the question is that I think, if I remember correctly, McNair made the point that in prior revolutions, that has been the case. And maybe he said, you know, there might be some exceptions, but this is a pretty big exception in my mind. To pivot, there's a pretty hefty little chunk of meat here. Something that you might recognize from the manifesto embedded here is a reaction of the country against the town. Here it's juxtaposed and more or less equated to a reaction of the peasants who have to pay the cost for the February revolution against the remaining classes of the nation. However, you know, it's not hard to abstract that from that specific composition of like class forces to the general dynamic of core and periphery within a nation, the town and the country, the reaction of the country against the town. If there is a real rhyme from the 18th Brumaire to the United States today, it's based on this. This is the ultimate underlying law of history, dynamic, whatever. Yeah, I think what this reminded me of is that like, it made me call the question a kind of like Maoist or post-Maoist idea that like the lumpen proletariat kind of represents the analog to the peasantry and that they are the ones who are going to surround the cities or whatever. When in reality, like a more accurate analog to the peasantry isn't the lumpen proletariat in like the urban cities, but rather the rural people living in a very rural town outside of Phoenix. I can testify to this. You know, they are going to represent the kind of backwards looking reaction and in a lot of ways for, you know, mom and pop shops and all that kind of stuff, like there is a material self-interest in why they're doing that. They're not just like dupes, you know, who are tricked into supporting policies that don't benefit them. They are backwards looking because they see, uh, you know, Walmarts and big O tire company moving in and closing down all the mom and pop stores and all the mom and pop mechanics. The guy I talked to yesterday is a case in point. Well, my car had problems. I took it in to get work done. And um, I just went to the first shop in Google Maps and it was five minutes away. And I went in wearing my bandana as like a, you know, covering, cl- cloth covering, cloth, cloth mask. And he kind of gave me this weird look. But then uh, I asked him about business and we got into all kinds of stuff like race and the pandemic and the response to the pandemic. And I have experience in through Renick Revolt and kind of doing counter recruitment work so my training and that just kind of kicked in and i started talking to him about these things and he's just kind of like your vague libertarian but he's not like a committed capital l libertarian you know he's like esri brought up the idea of like liberty is his culture or libertarianism is his culture and his self-interest is like he basically works here and there might be like one other employee And it's just him in this shop and he works on people's cars and that's his livelihood. And one of the things he said that was, that's very salient to this discussion and the idea of like rural people being a more accurate analog to the peasantry is he was talking about tire shops and he just admitted, because I need new tires, he just admitted that I'd be better off going to Big O Tire or one of the discount tires that just moved in because I could get a better deal. But It's sad that, you know, all the tire shops that have been around since he was a child have all closed down, you know, but he still recommended I go to the big place because it's the best price I could get, you know. You got to feel me on on town and country, though. It's in the manifesto. You got to transcend it in a way that doesn't look like suburbia because we have a negative example of how not to do it. But intellectuals thank you. don't think about the working class and, and don't understand. I mean, think about the working class in the abstract. Don't understand the working class. And, you know, like any, like any intellectual, like any self-respecting intellectual, is trying everything they can do to not slip into the proletariat. Like, that would be the point of making that your career. There's a reason that we don't hear stories like that. Marxists don't 
aren't interested in telling stories like that anymore. Well, and let's be more frank and honest. Like this guy is technically PB as like an owner of a business. I mean, maybe I misread him, but I, I'm pretty sure he was the owner. But he was no, the only person I ever interacted with, and he was the one working in my car as well. Maybe he doesn't have employers, and then that gets the puts the whole categorization into like iffy territory. But no, that's true. That's for our next reading series. Right, let's get there. Let's let, let's get there. Okay, I'm going to read this next bit around. Okay, so this is going down through how the the constituent national assembly was undermined. The very first meeting of the Council of Ministers resolved on the expedition to Rome, which it was agreed should be undertaken behind the back of the National Assembly and the means for which were to be wrested from it under false pretenses. Thus they began by swindling the National Assembly and secretly conspiring with the absolutist powers abroad against the revolutionary Roman Republic. In the same manner and with the same manoeuvres, Bonaparte prepared its coup of December the 2nd against the Royalist Legislative Assembly and its Constitutional Republic. Let us not forget that the same party which formed Bonaparte's ministry on December 20th, 1848, formed the majority of the Legislative National Assembly on December the 2nd, 1851. In August, the Constituent Assembly had decided to dissolve only after it had worked out and promulgated a whole series of organic laws which were to supplement the Constitution. On 6th of January 1849, the Party of Order had a deputy named Rateau moved that the Assembly should let the organic laws go and rather decide on its own dissolution. Not only the Ministry, with Odilon Barrault at its head, but all the Royalist members of the National Assembly told it in bullying accents that then its dissolution was necessary for the restoration of credit, for the consolidation of order, for putting an end to the in indefinite provisional arrangements and establishing a definitive state of affairs, that it hampered the productivity of the new government and sought to prolong its existence merely out of malice, that the country was tired of it. Bonaparte took note of all this invective against the legislative power, learned it by heart and proved to the parliamentary royalist on December 2nd, 1851, that he had learned from them. He repeated their own catchwords against them. The Barrow Ministry and the Party of Order went further. They caused petitions to the National Assembly to be made throughout France, in which this body was politely requested to decamp. They thus led the unorganised popular masses into the fire of battle against the National Assembly, the constitutionally organised expression of the people. They taught Bonaparte to appeal against the parliamentary assemblies to the people. At length, on January 29, 1849, the day had come on which the Constituent Assembly was to decide concerning its own disillusion. The National Assembly found the building where its sessions were held, occupied by the military. Changarnier, the general of the party of order, in whose hands the supreme command of the National Guard and troops of the, of the line had been united, held a great military review in Paris, as if a battle were impending, and the Royalists in coalition threateningly declared to the Constituent Assembly that force would be employed if it should prove unwilling. It was willing, and only bargained for a very short extra term of life. What was January the 29th but the coup d'etat of December 2nd, 1851, only carried out by the Royalists with Bonaparte against the Republican National Assembly? The gentleman did not observe or did not wish to observe that Bonaparte availed of himself of January the 29th, 1849, to have a portion of the troops march past him in front of the Tuileries and seized with avidity on just this, the first public summoning of the military power against the parliamentary power to foreshadow Caligula. They, to be sure, saw only their Shangarnier. I mean, goddamn. It's, it's very interesting coming through Brexit and Boris Johnson completely played to the people above and against Parliament. It's the first time in my political life, like in Britain or in Ireland, where the where the where I've seen the basically play against Parliament. You know what I thought of when reading this? Because it's funny you should say that, but I thought immediately of Margaret Thatcher and neoliberalism. If only we got rid of the red tape. You know, 
there are so many innovative uh, people out there, and we have we have the cure against Corona. Everything is dandy. It's just these goddamn regulations and uh, all this bickering and debate getting in the way of actual decisions. To me, this is this sounds like you know uh, predicting predicting Milton Friedman uh, way way before his time. I think what you're saying, though, Emmanuel, though that kind of neoliberal thing is more of a it's more of against legislation as against the parliament. You know, it's like these legislations were like we're like when Boris and these Bart Johnson was doing it, it was explicitly the parliament against the people. They explicitly would say those lines. You know, the parliament is the enemy of the people. So, like, that's why I, I think it's even more so than that kind of neoliberal shift. I, I don't know why, Emmanuel, but I'll, all I was really hearing is, you know, Daddy G, save us from the liberation. Like, because the, the way that uh, Ch China has ended up looking, even though, you know, they did, like, you know, keep their working class and just such a precarious position that it generated a crazy ass virus. And if you think there's something racist about saying that, that happened in the UK and in the United States at certain periods of their production where they had a similar place in the manufacturing, you know, global pecking order. So, you know, be materialist about it. Even though they did that, like, even though China like allowed this to happen, like they have tended to politically have played this off well because China was able to do some real like hardcore shit that no, like a few elected governments can do to try to stamp down on coronavirus. They did for some pretty draconian things. The like, like of, you know, d democracy versus, versus a dictatorship is that, you know, right. uh, a democracy has to slow things down by necessity in order to get uh, things checked and voted on, et cetera, et cetera. So democracy is all about slowing things down and all about checks and balances, whereas a dictatorship can do whatever the fuck they want. And, you know, there are defend defenders of, of fascism or, or Stalinism will, will frequently use that argument. In times of crisis, you need a firm hand, etc. which is, which is kind of what I, what I, what I got from, from, from this text that, you know, uh, oh, we need to do, we need decisive action in this country and the parliament is only keeping us back. <laughs> yeah. But I, I especially like, I, I love this part about, Bonaparte being like the sneaky bastard in the background, just listening in to the accusations about not being on the side of the, you know, the the true people. We have this with the conservative parties in, in Sweden as well, where they, like 10 years ago, they started on this campaign with, you know, no one listens to the real people in the streets. Like, call up your grandma and see what she thinks about abortion and the gays, right? You know, <laughs> People don't like the gays. Actual, this is this is a city phenomenon, right? This is decadence. Uh, the, yeah, yeah. It, th th this is a city phenomenon. If you if you go out in the country and ask real people, they're good, you know. Yeah, the salt of the earth, which is of course complete bullshit, uh, because you know it turns out that is actually totally not the case. But it's a really good myth, and so I I, I really like this the story about Bonaparte being like, hmm. Well, yeah, all right. Maybe you're right. Maybe I should go to the country and show show them what a good army I have. <laughs> well, it, yeah. it reminds me a lot of the establishment Republicans giving way to the Tea Party, giving way to Trump. Um, yeah. It, it's a similar dynamic. You know, interestingly, the Democrats have not pursued this, this sort of course of action. They have been entirely stalwart in circling the wagons, more or less, in saying, like, no, we will not turn the people against Congress. Absolutely not. Yeah, like, I, I, I'm of two minds of this because, of course, like, thinking about this in the context of Leninism, thinking about this in the context of fascism, there is a sort of Sorelian edge to this, like, class resentment and, like, you know, regional sort of tension that, like, is deep in the heart of reactionary authoritarianism. And, you know, specifically not like really a revolutionary kind. This is, it's, this is really where, where it comes from. If you're going to like try to draw out laws of history or whatever. We don't have Marx's view of Stalinism. You know what I mean? We just don't have it. But we have, I think, enough in his political writings to tell us what he would have thought about it. 
like the way the Stalin plays off the peasantry, you know, and then liquidates them makes it, you know, a little more complex. But like, this is essentially the appeal of authoritarian totalitarian systems. And it's weird today because we have a more like, I don't know, libertarian sort of aspect in the United States in the town of town and country divide or something. The whole appeal, this is something go, that goes back to Bakunin and Bakunin's read of the peasantry. The reason that the peasantry like the king is because the king is a check on the big bourgeoisie and the people that are, you know, trying to displace the peasants. Yeah. And LaSalle, the old hero of the German so, so, like socialist labor movement, wanted to leverage the czar against, you know, the bourgeoisie. So there's this whole like core in socialist history that Marx is trying to stake out another position from. Yeah. And, and this is what I, I think many people in outside of constitutional monarchies don't get is that, you know, uh, people people in the uk a, a lot of people in the uk really love the queen and the royal house etc and are like obsessed about it in sweden people aren't obsessed about the royal family as much but people are like neutrally either they don't care or they're like cautiously positive and there is a faction among the left to which i'm actually quite sympathetic that are like cautiously pro-monarchy for for this precise reason is that it is the one thing that the bourgeoisie can't privatize because like the royal family owns a lot of national parks and and stuff that if if the monarchy didn't still own those lands like the bourgeoisie would have privatized that and put up malls there instead of and just ram the forests to the ground and and build walmarts or or or, or whatever like it, it it is the one thing that the nation shares as a common cultural thing and and a, and a communal memory and a communal identity that even even the neoliberals do not dare to touch like that 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 really resonates with people i i used to be a monarchist social democrat but I really threw all that out the window with uh, the progression of parliament and the just the utter pathetic weakness of uh, <laughs> monarchical power in the face of an insurgent neoliberal uh, bourgeoisie. The U.S., for all of its flaws, doesn't have a monarchy and, you know, somehow has some national parks in spite of it being like a neoliberal shithole worse than a lot of other countries. If I do toot my own shit stain horn. But uh, I wanted to circle back around to something that Ezra said earlier about the libertarian edge of the American kind of core periphery division or rural urban division as like an an analogy for the peasantry and the workers, industrial workers. I think while there is like a kind of cultural libertarianism that I was referencing earlier, there is still this kind of uh, identification with the strong man and like... uh, a frustration at the bureaucrats gunning up the works and they just want a strong man to get get things done god damn it you know and that's why you know trump has this still has a, an appeal to that kind of person even though he pretty quickly abandoned his populist position i mean and now for campaign reasons in my opinion he's pivoted back to that a little bit with stimulus and his kind of rhetoric about wanting temporary Medicare for all, but I think it's all smoke and mirrors still, you know, but as long as he has the appearance of the strong man, his positions really don't matter because it's, it's all superficial, really. Kyle, do you want to take a handle on the last paragraph? After the Constituent Assembly had itself shattered its last weapon on January 29, 1849, the Ballot Ministry and the Friends of Order hounded it to death left nothing undone that it that could humiliate it, and wrested from the impotent, self-despairing assembly laws that cost it the last remnant of respect in the eyes of the public. Bonaparte, occupied with his fixed Napoleonic idea, was brazen enough to exploit publicly this degradation of the parliamentary power. For when on May 8, 1849, The National Assembly passed a vote of censure of the ministry because of the occupation of Civita Vecchia by Udinot. 
and ordered it to bring back the Roman expedition to its alleged purpose, Bonaparte published the same evening in the Moniteur a letter to Odino in which he congratulated him on his heroic exploits and in contrast to the ink-slinging parliamentarians already posed as the generous protector of the army. The royalists smiled at this. They regarded him simply as their dupe. Finally, when Marat, the president of the Constituent Assembly, believed for a moment that the safety of the National Assembly was endangered and relying on the Constitution requisitioned a colonel and his regiment, the colonel declined, cited discipline in his support, and referred Marat to Changarnier, who scornfully refused him with the remark that he did not like bayonet intelligent, intellectual bayonets. In November 1851, when the Royalists in coalition wanted to begin the decisive struggle with Bonaparte, they sought to put through in their notorious Quaestors Bill the principle of the direct requisition of troops by the President of the National Assembly. One of their generals, Le Flo, had signed the bill. In vain did Jean Garnier vote for it and Triel pay homage to the far-sighted wisdom of the former constituent assembly. The war minister, Saint Arnaud, answered him as Changarnier had answered Marat, and to the acclamation of the Montagne. Thus, the party of order, when it was not yet the National Assembly, when it was still only the ministry, had itself stigmatized the parliamentary regime, and it makes an outcry when December 2nd, 1851, banishes this regime from France. We wish it a happy journey. Bam. Yeah. So in like in eighteen in eighteen fifty one, when the National Assembly, Marx is saying here, started to get worried for themselves, they tried to bring in a bill saying that they could requisition troops. Basically, the army did exactly the same thing to them as they were happy to see happen to the Constituent National Assembly uh, three or four years before. So like. The, the exact same history would be itself. First time as tragedy, second time as farce, but both times as farce here, let's be honest. So we, we've gone the whole gamut here today of like actually talking about how the whole, the pure Republicans fell from being an ultimate power to basically under the foot of Bonaparte. Anything to say about this last paragraph then? Maybe don't... Uh post hoc try to assume the powers of the commander of chief it's pretty 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 bold move there but you know they already thrown out the constitutional process so whatever right well it seems it comes off as desperate and it's and it seems like it, it does it makes perfect sense to me that the generals would and the leaders of the military would be like <laughs> nah we're not doing that like how could you expect military men to respect your kind of like last minute groveling for military support you know like you clearly don't really hold any power so no we're not going to listen to you yeah and you know there's a lot of things we can criticize the bolsheviks for but they certainly took their lessons from this yeah oh yeah no they they weren't like yeah we're not going to like invite you to help govern actually we're probably just going to kill a bunch of you so you don't exist anymore and even though this wasn't a decision made in the in the higher ranks you know this was the logic behind it, killing the entire royal family you know you don't you don't even want to invite like the spirit of this in, the, in there i mean that also comes from the old french revolution the bolsheviks did learn that but on the other hand on lower levels of power in bureaucracy the bolsheviks found it necessary to recruit a lot of the old functionaries so it's still a mixed legacy definitely well we wish you a happy journey <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. This is pretty spicy. Because we keep talking about farce. There's this uh, Jean Baudrillard quote that says, "History that repeats itself turns to farce, but a farce that repeats itself ends up making a history." <laughs> oh. rip, like the process that you see happening, like what we're generalizing about from the 18th Brumaire, is this like you know. Scarily enough, like s- seemingly the only thing that can like marshal forces into some kind of state that reminds us of the old revolts, like at all, is in this direction. 
how do we handle this? You know, what 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 do, what do intelligent you know Marxists are trying to do? You know, something different than the past do about this or dumb Marxists? Yeah. You know, not just the smart ones. You know, all of us. Because, like <laughs> dur during the first chapter, I, I I could not get the picture of like tankies out of my head these farcical parodies of revolutionaries like larpers have to call upon the ghosts of previous revolutions that have that has shit fuck to do with whatever they're, they they think they're doing for legitimacy i mean goddamn that was bong rip take on current like internet commie politics <laughs> god i mean the, the the sort of history repeats itself cliche like reading this, you're like, fuck, haven't we learned anything from this? Like, so I, I do think that the point about the tankies is well taken. Absolutely. But when we look at how the proletariat and the socialists behave in this narrative here, like the whole thing kicks off with them losing. Right. And really Marx's advice it boils down to, yeah, don't, like waste your powers with a series of futile and ever diminishing revolts. If we look at the actual advice that Marx gives to the socialists in this. Yeah. He's essentially yeah. saying like, I mean, gather yourselves and your power before you act. Right. After you get your ass kicked the first time, like maybe step back and kind of regroup and look towards like long game, not short game, you know? He even goes further than that because he even says like that the proletariat in 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 this time could never have done anything in France. He says that like I think is it at the start of this section or the, at the end of last week's where he basically goes, you know, as it they they got their asses kicked as they only could have gotten there. It's the only thing that could have happened. Yeah. The fuck did you expect, Occupy? <laughs> I mean, not not to be not to be you know not, not to be too hot takey about this, but but like. I, I just pictured, you know, a tanky meme lord in their basement reading that. And like, I, th I know, think I think we have one in the chat that, that believes that uh, Marx would have defended the Stalin's terrorists. But go on. <laughs> just like you said, Tom, that, you know, what, it starts it starts off with a socialist defeat. Right. We had a, a social Democrat defeat in the Democratic Party very recently with bernie sanders uh, and you know the, the last century really has been a series of socialist defeats where the masses you know failed uh, and, and just a history of failed revolutions and failed revolts uh, etc and and reading that first chapter not to derail this this discussion to a former chapter but Reading that chapter, I, I thought, like, you know, especially when he talks about, you know, the, the sort of pessimism that comes comes out of it and the, the, and the anger after failed attempts and, and, and so on. I can think of no decade in which that is not relevant to the left. And I can think of no decade where the left has actually learned anything from that chapter. Uh, <laughs> like, maybe I'm being overly <laughs> pessimistic, but like... <laughs> I don't think you are. I mean, I, th I think, again, to really double down on this phrase, it's become one of my favorite phrases recently. Uh, you know, look for the laws of motion of these sorts of milieu or these, you know, political scenes, or, or I don't know how to describe this because it's actually broader than our little dumb, or excuse me, our little stupid microcultures that we have, you, you know, like there were broader socialist milieu at one point that had you know something more serious but they also didn't necessarily learn these things like so it's something we sort of have to assume going in and it's going to help orient marxists to theorize about this and take this on as part of our theoretical challenge what makes it so difficult to act what makes it so difficult to follow through on something it seems relatively straightforward why I think a little bit of it is like, um, you know, I think that Marx, if he was looking back at what uh, happened in Russia, he would say similar things to them at the start. He would say, oh, your forces both aren't good enough because internationally they're not good enough. Hold your fire, lads. You know, I think 
looking at what happened in, in this, if it, it would seem to me he would say exactly the same thing. And, you know, the error when it, it followed a, a weird meandering different path, which kind of goes Bonapartist from a, from a commie point of view. But, you know, basically the, the enemy of, the, of socialists are their leaders, not in a kind of a crappy anarchist way. I just mean like leaders want to be the figurehead and they want to get power and they're willing to take that extra risk at the certain times, how can we stop like leaders jumping because they can see a chance of being like a socialist leader ahead of the time when it needs to be done? I think that's a that is a really tough problem. Like that's a, like nearly a human nature problem as opposed to I know it's strategic, but it's also like how do you get how do you get around that kind of problem? To me, that's that's a big tough one. Like you really have to like indoctrinate everybody within a large internationalist <laughs> socialist grouping about that that importance you know that's that's a that's a big unknowable On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. Music